concept is God, unshapable and uncontainable. So, as Pastor was talking about believing, there's some things that have to happen for us to believe. And today, I believe the Lord's going to share some of that with us. So I'm going to be in several places today, and we're going to start off in, we're going to go to Second Chronicles, if you will, with me. Second Chronicles, chapter 21. And we're going to read a little bit, so bear with me. And it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 21, And Jehoshaphat rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. Then Jehoram, his son, reigned in his place. He had brothers, the sons of Jehoshaphat, Azariah, Jehiel, Zechariah, Azahu, Michael, and Shephathiah. All these were the sons of Jehoshaphat, king of Israel. Their father gave them great gifts of silver and gold and precious things with fortified cities in Judah. But he gave the kingdom to Jehoram because he was the firstborn. Now when Jehoram was established over the kingdom of his father, he strengthened himself and killed all his brothers with the sword and also others of the princes and also others of the princes of Israel. Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, just as the house of Ahab had done. For he had the daughter of Ahab as a wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Yet the Lord would not destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he had made with David. And since he, God, had promised to give a lamp to him, to his sons forever. In the days of Edom, revolted against Judah's authority and made a king over themselves. So Jehoram went out with his officers and all his chariots with him. And he rose by night and attacked the Edomites, who had surrounded him and the captains of the chariots. Thus Edom has been in revolt against Judah's authority to this day. At the time, Libna revolted against his rule because of he had forsaken the Lord, God of his fathers. Moreover, he made high places in the mountains of Judah, and he caused the inhabitants of Jerusalem to commit holotry and led Judah astray. And a letter came to him from Elijah the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord God of your father David, Because you have not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat your father, or in the ways of Asa king of Judah, but have walked in the way of the kings of Israel, and have made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to play the harlot, like the harlotry of the house of Ahab, and also have killed your brothers, those of your father's household, who were better than yourself. Behold, the Lord will strike your people with a serious affliction, your children, your wives, and all your possessions. And you will become very sick with a disease of your intestines until your intestines come out by reason of sickness day by day. Moreover, the Lord stirred up against Haram, Jehoram, the spirit of the Philistines and the Arabians who were near the Ethiopians. And they came up into Judah and invaded it and carried away all the possessions that were found in the king's house and also his sons and his wives so that there was not a son left to him except Jehoaz, the youngest of his sons. After all this, the Lord struck him in his intestines with an incurable disease. Then it happened in the course of time, after the end of two years, that his intestines came out because of his sickness. 
So he died in severe pain, and his people made no burning for him like the burning of his fathers. So wow, what a story, huh? Here's a man who has a dad that was king before. He's doing his thing, sets up all these idols that were, all the idols that were before them. His dad brings them down. All the things that were set up to be higher than God, his dad brings it down. And what does he do? He takes everybody out because this way there's no competition. You can't come against me if you're not there. So he's king. He's doing his thing. And now he says, you know what? In order for me to look right and do what I want to do, I've got to take everybody out. So here he is putting himself above by eliminating all that are there. So you go, where are we going, right? We said the title was God, unshapeable and uncontainable, okay? And pastor's talking about hearing about believing, okay? So God was telling me this morning that in order for us to get there, we've got to bring some things down, okay? Now we got a man here that brought some things down but he did it not in the way that pleased the Lord. And oftentimes, it's easy to think that what God said he was going to do, he's really not going to do, right? Remember, Pastor kept saying, remember God's promises. Remember, they're real. They're still here. He's faithful. Oftentimes, we don't think that the things that he said not to do still mean that they're not to do now. You know, it's easy to remember he's faithful, but also we've got to remember his sovereignty. That when he says these commandments and he tells us these things, just because we change doesn't mean God changes from there, right? God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? But remember, we're talking about an unshapeable and uncontainable God. So it kind of blows the mind when we start to try to think of God doesn't change, yet he's forever evolving in us. See? There's a catch there. It's easy to think that, oh, I discovered something new about God. God knows about himself. It's us that we get to know him more. So as he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, there's still so much that we don't know about him. And we have a tendency, like Jehoram, to take out the things that we think are in our way. And I'm not saying this is always positive. It wasn't positive for what he did, okay? There's things that we can remove, yes, and we're going to talk about those. But there's things that we try to remove thinking that, hey, this is going to work out just fine for me. Jehoram took out all the people, I mean his brothers, all the princes. He took out anybody that had any authority. His word was it. And he stood with no one else to contest him. But God had said something way before time. If you know this story, Elijah wasn't there. Elijah was gone already. And you go, what? Wait, I thought you just said, I thought you just said in verse, uh, let's see, 12, that a letter came to him from Elijah the prophet. Elijah was long gone. Imagine you're about your business and somebody from the past comes out with a letter and they come bring it to you. I mean, I'm just... I hope you can see. I hope the Holy Spirit opens your eyes to this thing. It's no coincidence. This is the sovereignty of God. How God does things and we think, ah, it didn't go nowhere. It's dead in the water. That was then. 
It was a thing when Elijah was here. Nobody's even thinking about this letter. Oh, but God. So just reading, the scholars say that this letter must have been given by Elijah to someone he trusted, maybe Elijah, and told them there'll be a time when you'll know that it's time to release this. Glory to God. The thing about being in relationship that we've been talking about with God is knowing the timing. Knowing when he says now and when he says stop. Knowing that he's sovereign and that he don't waste your time. Everything that's happened in your life, whether you think it's coincidental or why, why did I do that? You know, I used to cut grass, or I used to be a carpenter, I used to do this. You go, ah, oh, those days are old, they're gone. God's got a purpose for all that. He works it all together for his glory and our good. And here's this letter that comes up from a man of God that's long gone. Here's a king that has nothing to do with that. He's just living his life. He's in charge. I'm, I'm it. I'm everybody out. I'm in charge. And all of a sudden... We've got a letter for you. Okay, who's writing me? Who, who's going to speak to me? I'm a king. I'm in charge. So what? And when he sees Elijah, he, now the humanness of me, okay? If I'm here and I'm doing this thing, and all of a sudden I hear a prophet from old has a letter for me, first I'm going to go, there's no way. And then I'm going to try to explain the miracle or explain the, the situation. I said, could it be Mother Perry you're up to something? Mother Perry is playing with me, right? This can't be a prophet. This can't be a letter from him. Or then if I fear God, I might go, could it be that this came from heaven? A modern day miracle? Because I'm not thinking that God did this way back over here and gave a letter to this prophet from a prophet Tell him what's going on over there and told him to hold it for such a time when God would reveal it that it'd be appropriate to what was happening. I don't know if I'm making any sense this morning. But God's sovereignty, God's planning, God's wisdom and his ways are mind blowing. It's uncontainable to think that if you research it, Elijah has been gone for a while. Bless you. A time on end. He wasn't even really named then. Everybody knew his name, but he wasn't named. And here comes this letter. And you know what? It's talking from the Lord God of your father David. And he's telling him exactly what's going to happen to him. Hey, it's not going to end good. I know what you've done. I knew what you did back then. I knew what you did back then before you did it, before you were born, before you were into this. If you check it out, that letter's way back in Elijah. If you look at the time, he wasn't even around. So that might blow your mind. You go, well, if God knows all this, that I'm going to do all this, why, why go through all this? God's love. God's love. Because of your free will, you could choose. You could choose to do this or that. He's not abusive. He's not mean. He's sovereign, but he's not mean. He don't believe in, you got to love me, first lady. You got to. He don't say, oh, don't love me or I'm going to zap you. Because look, we're all here. Just saying, just saying, we're all here. And here's this man, he gets this letter, and he's hearing that he's going to get sick. And, you know, this reminds me a little bit about Hezekiah. Do you remember Hezekiah? When the prophet came and said, you're going to die. 
But I already read to you what Jehoram did. Did he turn to the wall and say, God, forgive me, please. I'm sorry. I'm going to change my ways. Show me. Did he do that? No, right? But Hezekiah did. And look what happened to Hezekiah. The prophet didn't even walk out of the grounds of the kingdom and already the Lord told him, get back up there. You got something to tell my son. And he extended his life. But here Jehoram, yeah, this is a fluke. There's no way Elijah's going to write to me. But if you look at it, it says, the letter says, does says, Lord God of your father David. It didn't say that the prophet said, right? And if you look at the Old Testament, it tells us that uh, you know a prophet is from God if what he says or she says comes to pass, right? If it doesn't, then you know they weren't speaking of God. God makes it really clear. He doesn't mince words. He tells you, if they're from me, it'll come to pass. So here it is. I already read it to you. We've got Jehoram doesn't repent, doesn't change his ways. But does it happen overnight that he's sick? Time passes, right? And that brings me back to, if you remember Nebuchadnezzar, how many times did Nebuchadnezzar Say, oh, God Almighty, yes, you're the true God. I won't mess with, you know, Daniel no more. I won't do this. I won't do that. And then he built a statue. And then he forgot that the Lord had told him, hey, you're going to be eating grass. Do you remember that? He forgot because he got full of himself. He got a statue. Everybody bow down to me. But again, God told him back here. Like he's told us, there's certain things about God that God does not like. God doesn't appreciate disrespect because he's always respecting you. I mean, think about it. Out of all the gods, Buddha, uh, you, you, you name whoever, whatever God. I told you last week. We have the only God that has a son and a Holy Spirit. That's love. That's love. He don't like to be disrespected. He doesn't disrespect you. Do you know the Bible says he never sleeps or slumbers? Man, God is always awake in your behalf. Do you know what the Bible says? He holds nothing good from you. But what do we do? We try to shape them. We're going to put you like man. Or we're going to think of you like us. And we attribute things to God like if he was us. And then we go... We're going to put you right here, God, while I go do this. We think we can shape them. We think we can contain them. Especially, remember last week I told you about being a genie? That he's not a genie? That a lot of times we go, oh, I need this, please. And we make promises. And when it doesn't happen, we go about our own devices. Like, the whole realm. Now, if you would be so kind, I want you to go with me to number 16. Number 16. Now, I'm not going to read all this to you. I just want you to go there. This is the family that I talked to you about last week as well, Cora. I don't know if you had a chance to read it, but the Lord told me to refresh that for you. Now, this family felt that, you know, basically, like, there's a whole generation saying, why do we got to listen to you, Pastor? Why does God only speak to you? And it was Moses then. And 
if you read the story, you know, there's several, Moses, Aaron, and all that, and they go before God. And the wild thing about it is that even though they're all there, God speaks to Moses. If you read it, God speaks to Moses. It doesn't say that he spoke to Aaron and Korah and all that. And he even leads Moses to say, hey, Korah, guess what? Something's going to happen. And he even tells the people, get away from Korah. Get away because they're going to go. Get away. And do you know that some people didn't listen? And they went, the whole generation went. So the Lord wanted me to remind you of that one. Now if you'll slip over to Exodus 32. I know we're just traveling because I got a couple scenarios to show you. Exodus 32 talks about the golden calf. I'm going to read just about five verses for you. From one to five. Exodus 32. It says, now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for Moses... The man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives and sons and daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it in with a graving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, this is our God. O Israel that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when the Aaron, so when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And then they rose to the next day, offered burnt offerings, and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose to play. Now, as you read on, you're going to find that God wasn't pleased with this. Do you know where Moses was? Moses was in the presence of God. But the people got distracted. Do you think that maybe they were there just because of Moses? Think about it. Moses is delayed, and they're like, okay, I'm tired of waiting. So what do we do? We need somebody to follow. He's gone. Let's find somebody to follow. Now, these folks, remember, they had been led by God. You know, it's easy for me to think now, wow, if I had a pillar, a, a fire, and, and a cloud, and I got fed by it from heaven, and I saw these things, and we came out of slavery, and I'm going to a promised land, and I'm with all the brethren, and I got a man of God that can take the, the stick and make a serpent and all these things. But guess what? Now he's gone. He's gone so long that we don't know what happened. And the way man is, we think maybe God took him out. So now we got to fend for ourselves. Do you think that maybe they would line up with what they've been taught? They had a plan. They knew that they were going to promised land. He didn't need Moses there to tell them what the next step was. But instead, they chose to get another God. You know, and maybe none of this makes sense to you today. Maybe it does. But today, modern day, we choose different gods. We put things above God. Whether it be a job, with a mighty dollar, or ourselves. I'm not going to go through nothing. No, uh -uh. no, I'm not doing that. Let them do it. 
Because like Jehoram, we are in a position where we take this free will of picking and choosing to do what we please for ourselves. Versus looking at what's the plan already? What's the plan already? Salvation, sharing the good news. We talked about today, think about what the Lord has done. Last week I was before you with a splint and a half cast. I have x-rays that said I broke my elbow. You know, I'm Googling, what does that mean? How does it get fixed? I'm talking to people, they're like, oh, I did it. I got this, I got surgery, I got a cast for eight weeks, I did this, I, I still ain't the same, da, da, da. And I'm going, huh, what do you have for me, Lord? And during 4th of July, I had neighbors that invited me over, and they're chastising me. They're like, I see you just working, I see you just going, I see you just driving, you're not supposed to be doing that. And I'm going, yeah, yeah, I know. But I'll be honest with you, I got a little annoyed. And I said, I'm out of here, man. I don't want to be with people who don't know Jesus. <laughs> so I go with mother, pick her up, and we're going to fellowship with other place. And just being with mother, she's like, I'm telling her about it. And I hear her, you're healed, you're healed, you're healed, you're healed. And I go, now I'm in the right place. Okay? So what's wild about it is a week, maybe not even a week, a couple days later uh, after Bible study for Tuesday, I go home, and lo and behold, all those neighbors are sitting in a driveway right next door. So they see me, they're like, here she is again. Bet she just came back from working. And I said, well, no, I just got back from Bible study. And they're like, hmm, like still moving at home, I see you. Because I took off my sling to drive, so they were like, not even in the sling. And I'm sitting there, and I'm going, and she's like, the one lady that was really at it, she's like, you keep doing all those things, you're just going to make it worse. I said, well, tomorrow I have an appointment with the ortho. I said, I'm believing God for a miracle. And then I started, you know, stepping back. Y'all have a good evening. Oh, sorry. Let me wave with my good hand. So that was Tuesday. So Friday, I go to the ortho, sitting in there. He comes in. He says, let's take this off. Here's my x-ray. He goes, okay, I'll be back. He goes back, does his thing. Then he comes and he starts messing with my arm. And I'm watching him. He's closing his eyes and he's going. And I'm going. And I'm asking God, why is he closing his eyes? That's kind of weird. He should know what he's doing. And the Lord tells me, I got him. I got him. And I'm like, okay, did I close my eyes? The Lord's like, no. And the guy was just, the doctor kept just feeling around. And he goes, you know what? Take that thing off. I said, what? What'd you say? He said, we're going to take that thing off. He threw the half cast in the trash, and I was like, glory. I, I mean, my heart just, I want to just, like, if I could, I'd pick him up and go, yeah, glory to God. But I'm like trying to contain myself. And he's like, yep. He goes, no, no, none of that. I said, no sling? He said, no, no. He said, it's time to get him moving. And I said, like moving like I could go back to moving? He said, yep. He goes, what you want to do is start working it out because you don't want it to stay bent. He said, because then you'll have other problems. I said, oh, no, we're, we're going straight. We're going straight. He says, Okay. I'll see you in two weeks, so it's up to you to work that arm. I said, oh, Lord, I could work this arm. And I left out of there, but I was texting. Oh, my gosh, people, you just, my neighbor. My neighbor that I know is going to tell the whole block. So I said, hey, sis. Oh, sorry, not sis. Hey, so-and-so. I'm in the ortho appointment. I said, and you'll never guess what? And I'm, you know, all these emojis and all these exclamations. I said, the Lord gave me the miracle. He healed me. And I launch it, right? Then I copy and paste it. I'm sending it to Sister Lori. I'm sending it to anybody who the Lord puts on my heart. Okay? So if you didn't get it, don't get mad. It's just where the Lord sent me. 
And she comes back, she goes, oh, look out, here goes loose, on the loose again. And I said, the Lord healed me. I said, now don't get me wrong. There's work to be done. But I ain't in that sling or that cast no more. I said, won't he do it? She's like, okay, who's he? I said, well, guess what? God, Jesus. And she's like, all right, Lou. But then I come home a day later, and guess what happened? That neighbor that kept telling me, stop working, stop doing it, stop doing it. She, she's now walking really fast. And normally she don't stump me too long. She's walking really fast, like to the middle of the, she lives in the cul-de-sac, I live more here. She's walking like this, like a beeline, and I'm going, she ain't got no dog, where's she going? And I'm looking up the block, nothing, it's just me. And she goes, what happened? You don't have your sling on. I said, I'm healed. Right in the middle of the street, I'm like, I'm healed. Jesus, heal me. And she's like, glad to hear. I bet you're going to be cutting your grass now. I said, yes, ma'am. So you see, God is sovereign. God, God is available. God is there. He has, he has things in store that if we don't put anything above him, he's faithful. He's kind. He's not abusive. But he has standards. We can't just come at him like he's just no one. If you were here on Tuesday night, I talked about Esther. You know, Esther and all the women that were going to wanting to be queen needed to learn kingdom etiquette. Because I was sharing with using Sister Lori as my sample that I can't just go, yo, 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 what's up? I'm here. I want to be the queen. I heard Vashti didn't listen to you, so guess what? I'm your new queen. No. They went through 12 months of preparation. Why? Because they had to shed all this stuff that wasn't kingdom-like. So when she comes before the king, remember, he had to extend his scepter, right? In order to be, you can talk to him. He didn't just come in, hey, king, I got a problem. You could be burning up with a problem. Your intestines could be coming out like Jehoram. You ain't getting in front of the king. So this queen, all these queen wannabes needed to learn etiquette, and it took 12 months. And they couldn't bring any of their stuff. Man, that'll preach by itself right there. Can't bring all your stuff. So what does that mean? Do I got to be a fake and phony to before God? I got all these problems and act like I don't have it? Like he said, check them at the door. God's about your business if you're about his, right? Seek the kingdom first and all his righteousness, all these things will be added to you. When I've had the biggest breakthrough is because I'm in his presence. When the world thinks I'm defeated. Because again, remember, we don't wage war like the world does. We're different people. We're his king's kids. So we don't do like the world. Lord, I hope this is, is this, you're capturing this. You're not... You're not who you used to be. You don't act the way you used to be. You don't use the options you used to use. You know, as a single person, I'm, I've got more help ever in my life than I've ever had when I had a whole group of people with me. Why? Because I've partnered up with Jesus. Like we sang, he's our provider, he's our peace. We can't shape them and, and contain them. Now, if you will, come with me all the way. We're going to walk all the way to Acts, Acts 17. If you haven't forgot about the whole realm, he's there with his intestines, and they're out. And he's been buried, and he hasn't been buried in a really fashionable way. They just buried him, like, you know, to be kind. But he didn't get all the accolades that he could have got. Had he been in the right standing with God? 
So in Acts 17, we find Paul. Let's go to verse... Let's go to verse 16. Again, I'm giving you a little more word today than you probably want, but we're going to go for it. So 17, Acts 17, verse 16 and following, says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Okay? Idols, again, if you don't know what an idol is, okay, there's a little quote here that I want to read to you that says, Isaiah asked in the book of Isaiah, he says, who would form a god or mold an image that profits him nothing? Okay? We think of idols as statues of wood or stone, but in reality, an idol is anything natural that is given sacred value and power. And then he asks these questions in this little commentary here. It says, how would you answer these questions? Who created me? You don't have to answer out loud. Just think about it. Whom do I ultimately trust? When everything's done down, who do I ultimately trust? If you have anything besides God, if it's money, substances like alcohol, marijuana is a thing for a lot of people today, my friend, my mother, and like we all said, our families, we got to look at that, right? It says, to whom do I look for ultimate truth? When I'm in a pinch, who do I know is going to be honest and be forthright with me? Do I have to beat past his door down because that's the only person I believe is true? Or do I before the, go before the throne of grace and go, I need, I need help, I need revelation, I need direction? Nothing against our pastor. To whom do I look for security and happiness? Remember, we're talking about putting stuff higher than God. So if anything comes up other than God, you know the answer key. That, that needs to be looked at. And who is in charge of my future? Is it Benjamin? You know who I'm talking about, right? The Benjamins. Are they in charge of my future? Am I in charge of my future? Just to think about. So here we got Paul, right? Talking about giving over to idols. Verse 17 says, Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the Gentile worshipers in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. So he's witnessing, right? Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, What does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. So they call them foreign because they didn't know about him. Just like when people see you, they're like, you're strange. I don't know about you. Because you are. You're a peculiar person. You don't act like the world. So yeah, you're different. And a lot of times they don't know what to do with different. Okay, I'll stick to the word. And they took him and brought him to the Arapogos, saying, May we know what this doctrine is of which you speak, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the atheists and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Verse 22, then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. 
God, who made the whole world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. So remember, God is unshapeable, uncontainable, above all things. And if he's unknown to you, please know he's the giver of life. And he loves you. And I thank God for this opportunity. This is all I have for you today. God bless you. Hallelujah. Wow. God, unshapeable. Unbelievable. And you know, I tell you, I was taking some notes as, as Elder was, was, was ministering. Um, and just, just, you know, so much of the time, and I'm not trying to steal her thunder or, or go behind her, but I, I got to share this because, you know, a lot of what God has been speaking to me uh, here recently, and and even about the body, and even my own personal life, um, you know, so much of the time we put God on the the low rung of the totem pole, but we don't have a problem calling on Him or anybody when stuff really starts happening. We don't talk to Him half the time, but when trouble come, God help me. God help me. But if we walk with him all the time, when trouble come, it's no reason to panic because he's been holding your hand the whole time. And, you know, one of the things that, that, that uh, Elder said that, that God gave me that I wrote down, the, the, the first thing she said that, that really stuck out to me, stop operating under the world standards. Because we're a peculiar people, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. We're not supposed to act like the world. But why do we depend on the world system to take care of us more than God? Did, did, you, hear, did you hear over in Chronicles 21 when she was talking about the king who, who took everybody out. And see, there's sometimes in life there's some people that will try to take you out and take out other people that, that you think or they think that, you know, they need to remove. But God will raise up somebody else from the past or somebody from somewhere else and set what you need straight. That's why we have to constantly look to God. The, the Bible says looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith. A lot of times we forget because, you know, when things stop going or start looking uh, a, a different way or contrary to what our eyes, you know, are saying, we kind of say, well, you know, I'm not really sure what God is doing, so let me do this. No, God says, like she said, stay the course. Why are you going to change just because it looks a little different to you? What did God tell you? If God said that you were the head, not the tail, you're the head, not the tail. I was meditating this on this yesterday. It's impossible for God to lie. If you're up above, you're above. No matter what it looks like. No matter when, when things happen in your life, when your situations come about. So, and, and you know, and I, heard, I heard something recently. I was listening to a man of God. He was preaching. You know, even when your finances get a little low, that don't mean that you're out. Low doesn't mean no. Because, I, you know, I've learned one thing here recent not recently, I shouldn't say that because I've learned this a while ago. I'll never be broke another day in my life because I trust God. I believe God. Now, I may not have any money on me right now, but I'm still not broke. Because I don't count on my bank account, I count on his bank account. If I'm his son, you're his son or his daughter, why do you keep worrying about what's in your account? Faithful is he that promised. God will show up. See, see, I got some people that don't believe that. 
God will show up when, when it looks like there's no way, there's no, it looks like nothing's going to come through, ever going to happen for you, and you sitting back going like, God, what am I going to do? God said, just believe. God said, trust me. And stop seeing, you know what? God doesn't need anything in this world. Just like that letter, and, and that is that is an amazing story that she, that she talked on. A letter from the past show up in your present. God can pull something from the past for such a time as this and fix your situation, turn your situation around if you believe him. But the problem is we stop believing. We start dealing with out here more than what God said on, on the inside. And the thing about it is, how many times has God come through for you? Well, let me ask this question. Raise your hand if you've been in a tough situation and God brought you out. Now, and, I, and I'm not talking about, no, just, you know, you in church kind of situation. You know, I'm talking about, you know, because you know how we can get in church, you know, we just want to be religious. Everybody else raised their hand. You know, God bless me. But I'm talking about you've been in a tough spot and you didn't know how you were going to come out. You, I mean, this thing looked bleak. It looked dark. It's like, Lord, I don't, you know what? I'm about to go do something that I know I shouldn't do just to make something happen. But I didn't have to do that because God came through. God provided. God showed me a way. God made a way when there seemed to be no way. But a lot of times we forget that God, you know what, the Bible, I said that when I was on the keyboard. God know what you have need of even before you ask him. Why do we trust so much in the world system? When Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. We're in the world, but not of the world. God just wants us to believe and to trust him. Oh, my God. And stop relying on this world system, y'all. Let me ask, let me ask you. I don't know. This just popped in my head. And it, I'm just, this is in my head. Because how many of y'all know you need, to, you need to think about the word sometimes? You need to think about how God operates. When we get to heaven. Do you think God's going to pull resources from the earth to take care of you when you get to heaven? He don't, he don't need to. I'm, I'm, say, I'm saying we, now we, all, we all in heaven now. But he said, I got to run. Let me, God said, oh, y'all need something to eat. Let me run down here to the earth and get y'all some bread. I don't, I don't need, God said, I don't need to do that. The, the, the earth is supposed to be a mirror of what's going on in heaven anyway. It's supposed to be. So when I say that, you know what I'm saying? That they, they, they have, I believe they have trees in heaven. I believe there's water in heaven. I know there's streets in heaven. The streets are paved with gold in heaven. They're not asphalt. So it's supposed to be a picture of that. So, so what I'm saying is God doesn't need to come down when we get to, okay, wait a minute, hold it. My mama's in heaven. Mama not eating bread from Wonder Bread in heaven right now. But she, she's eating a heavenly Wonder Bread. She's eating manna from heaven. She's, you know what I'm saying? So, so, so God doesn't need, he doesn't need, Elder Lou said so clear. She said she got healed. A mirror, God don't need nothing down here unless he wants to use it. But if you keep your eyes on him and let him, let him determine what he's going to do for you. Let him use whoever he wants to and stop trying to make things happen on your own. Stop trusting. Just trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and let him direct your path. God will provide. He'll show what I'm telling Look, I'm not telling you what I heard. I'm telling you what I know. I've seen God come through time and time and time again. When I got my back up against the wall and my mind is going, Lord, how in the world is this going to happen? God said, I got it. It's already done. Calm down. Look to me, the author, the finish of your faith. Mm. Elder, great job, great job, great job. I thank God. Man, I tell you, you know, I, I, I was.